a little earlier uh, when we had the panel that was up here, we were talking about innovation. We were discussing the importance and the need to make sure that we were able to scale. And one of the areas that all of us are very interested in scaling is this idea of the reduction of carbon emissions. It's a daunting task and one that we all know it's something we have to pay a lot of attention to. And we know that we're living in a world of KPIs, of act and measure, and a host of other metrics that are really designed to make sure we're keeping ourselves honest. This is especially true when it gets to that issue of making sure we're reducing carbon. I'd like to introduce you to Bennett Indart of NTT Smart World, who's going to talk to us and show us how scaling up measurements of our carbon footprint is going to result in scaling down our emissions. Bennett, please join us on stage. Thank you, Paul, for the introduction. Um, really happy to be here. Thank you all for coming. What a great show we put on, and we're in the home stretch, right? Okay, so let's get going. I'm here today to talk about, and, and we've kind of progressed all the way through from basic research and fundamental research on things like a bio data, cardiovascular data twin, using photonics for data processing. And then we talked to some research as well as VC folks and innovators within NTT about how to take a lot of that research and how you progress it through its life cycle to take it to market. Um, and we talked about uh, attribute-based encryption as one of those examples uh, as features and functionalities for these types of things as we go to market. I'm going to talk today about some of the things that we did call research maybe 15, 20 years ago that have made their way through and we've heard them used today in the form of things like IoT, data science, cloud computing, networking, and that convergence that's happening today that allow us to do things that we haven't been able to do before and the data that's being generated by all of those things. And I'm going to talk to, I'm going to, talk to it today through the lens of sustainability and more specifically through carbon emissions and carbon emissions reporting. So before I get started on that, I think there's a little bit of context that we can go through and a little bit of a history lesson. And I'm not going to go all the way back. There are instances of people talking about sustainability going back to 500 BC, you know, if you believe what's on the internet. But let's start in 1970 with Earth Day. Earth Day started in the United States, April 22nd, 1970, and it quickly became a global movement. In fact, in 1990, just uh, 20 years later, 200 million people in 140 different countries were celebrating Earth Day. And in today's world, over a billion people it has become the largest secular single day movement on the globe. It has also spawned a lot of other things, like the EPA, the Clean Air Act, and, and others in other countries. Um, taking that, other considerations, other things, other movements have been spawned. Um, not sure how many of you actually recognize this, but this was the UN kind of really getting into the game back in 2000 with the Millennium Declaration. Eight different components across the board, they, they took what Earth Day had really started and added social responsibility to it, added humanitarian type uh, metrics to it. And Goddess really started, 189 countries signed on to this in September of 2000. The, the problem was is that just a year later, the world lost its focus with 9-11 and a lot of the wars that were going on at that time. And so there was a lot of a distraction on this. And so, in 2015, the UN came back with something you're probably more familiar with, as you probably have heard about the SDGs and the sustainability goals that the UN has put out, 17 different goals across, again, a wide variety of areas, but really what define from a global country-by-country -country perspective their version of sustainability. Now, that's one leg of a three-legged stool, I call it, the sort of the global national municipalities and government movement. In order to get something to really become more mainstream, you need a few more stool, uh, a few more uh, legs on the stool. One of those is what we have now become very commonplace in our world is ESG. This is from the World Economic Forum, but it takes a lot of different forms today. It is becoming more and more defined, but still in its early stages. 
again, looking at things like re renewable fuels from an, from an environmental standpoint, but also social and governance added to that in the form of financial markets, investments, and all of those things that kind of run our world today in that global economy. So if you take that and you take the 17 SDGs and you map that over the top of the ESGs, you get something like this. And as I mentioned in the beginning, I'm gonna focus on the E and we're gonna focus specifically around carbon emissions. And I'll tell you why in the next view. Uh, NTT and the Wall Street Journal recently conducted a survey of about 350 corporations, CEOs, CIOs, and, and others, and asked them um, a series of questions, and I'll build this slide out. But the first question they asked was, can you prioritize these ESG components in, in your view? And this is the priorities that they came up with. No surprise, carbon emissions is at the top of the list. Then they asked them a series of other questions regarding how are you publicizing this, what you're doing in terms of your ESG or your carbon emissions and your, and your reduction of that. Have you said, I'm gonna be carbon neutral by a certain date? A lot of companies have, as you see here. In fact, only 2% said it was not part of a broader framework. And this is a, a, a pretty good group of, of executives from the Wall Street Journal's uh, group of, of uh, respondents. Now, that's great. And we are seeing that every day when we read the news and we see companies coming out and talking about their goals. The problem is, is when you get to the last question they asked, which was, are you measuring it? And 16% said they were measuring it. And so my research is, as someone that's kind of taking these types of things to market in NTT, I looked at that and I said, well, there is a problem that we can solve. So. We looked at that and then I asked my question, why else would only 16% be measuring it? Well, there's a lot of different reasons if you, you know, if you think about it. A couple are, well, there's mounting sort of scrutiny. When you come out and you say, I'm gonna do this or I'm gonna have you know, um, sustainable packaging or I'm going to have you know, eco-friendly types of, of habits in, in, in my company, today's world, with social activism and things like that, it, it becomes amplified. And so you find that, you know, things like the SEC and the, and the uh, Federal Trade Commission fining companies for not maybe in their mind being truthful has kind of put a little bit of the brakes on. Um, and I also mentioned that, you know, in, including the governments of the world and then the ESG being the second stool or second leg of the stool, the third leg of the stool is that social activism. And that's everything on this right panel over here came from some kind of social media, social activism, they were called out. So it's not just the compliance piece of it and the penalties that come with that, but there are other things around awareness. So there's a lot of different sustainability authorities that are providing guidance, providing what we're calling standards. But as you know, when something starts new, there aren't really any standards. And so it takes some time for the dust to settle and then the standards will show up. And we'll talk a few about a few of those that are kind of rising to the top. Uh, so awareness is pretty low. Green hushing, which is the opposite of green washing. So I'm saying I'm going to be as a good corporate citizen, I'm, I'm gonna to profess to do things that I'm going to really try to measure those, but I'm not gonna talk about, about it as much because I wanna keep it out of that, that um, sort of social criticism area. Uh, rising inflation concerns around the cost of it. There is a financial impact to doing sustainable projects. And then on the other side, incentives, and then again, compliance. You can hit them with a stick or you can show them the love. And so there's two different ways to ins incent uh, companies to, and, and organizations and people for that matter, uh, to, to start embracing sustainable habits. Now. The quote at the bottom is part of that awareness. Um, how many of you know what the greenhouse gas protocol is? Just show hands. That's exactly what I thought, and that's what the 10% is there. But you may know it by three other names, scope one, scope two, and scope three. All right, so there is a little bit of a disconnect there in terms of you know, what people are asking in this survey and then what, is, what they actually know. And, and this will continue to get more and more prominent in our daily lives as we go. Uh, greenhouse gas, 
um, the, the World uh, Resource Institute and the World Business Council for Sustainable Development created this, and it's becoming one of those that I said are rising to the top. You're hearing about it a lot. Companies are starting to look at how their business actually fits across these profiles. Some of them that are high in di distribution, very disconnected, will be more scope three heavy. Uh, others that are more centralized um, will be more scope one and scope two heavy. Uh, and it just lists the different types of energy activities upstream and downstream. And we're going to see, I think, more of this. Uh, TCFD is another one that's coming out for more financial uh, reporting guidance. Uh, but there are a lot of them. And so when you're a company and you're looking at this and you're trying to figure out how I need to approach it, there are a lot of different options. And so companies like NTT can help with that. And I'll show you one of the ways that we're doing that today uh, as we go further. So again, how did we get here? I mentioned a couple of things around awareness, around uh, uh, green hushing and some of the phenomenons that are going on, but it is here to stay. Sustainability is in our vernacular. It is going forward. The younger generations are adopting it like no other generation before them. It is going to happen. And so when the dust settles, will you be ready? And will you be there to be able to comply with the reporting? The SEC's come out with their guide, guidelines that they're going to start putting in place in 2024. So will, will you be ready as a, as a company to be able to start reporting on that? And, and I like to look at things in a very simple manner, but to say step by step, I have three steps. First step, collect and measure. If you can't measure something, it's really impossible to manage it. Uh, so measure, then manage. So you have to collect the data. You have to know where the data exists and where it sits, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But you need to have that foundation. And once I know what I'm doing today from the first step, what's my energy footprint today, then I can go to the next step, which is where am I headed? Can I take the things that I'm doing today um, and project them forward just using simple math and move it forward? doing some trend analysis. And then once I've done that, and I may see that I've made a pledge to be carbon neutral by 2030, uh, am I going to hit that doing what I'm doing today? Now, the third step is, if you've done number one and number two correctly, theoretically, you have a digital twin because you have all the connections, you know what, what running, what's running through the pipes, and you can create that what if scenario management to say, I can change or I can optimize or I can accelerate my behavior just by doing some digital analysis before I actually have to implement it. I can also look at the financial implications of doing such a thing. So now I'm making much more insightful business decisions for my company, for my shareholders, for my environment. Overlaying that on scope one, scope two, and scope three at the bottom, you now have the basis for a journey map. And companies, again, like NTT and your partners will have other ways to help you with this along that journey. You can go scope one all the way across and say, I want to know ex my business is heavy scope one. I want to understand exactly what I'm doing and report on that and understand how I can optimize and accelerate that. Or you go all the way across all three scopes because you have a good distributed model. You have to decide on that path. And then we can enable that with technology, which is why I'm here. So NTT has developed a truth in what we call truth and sustainability. And, and we chose the name specifically because of the lack of awareness that we have out in the market today. Uh, simply put, it helps you onboard your sustainability journey. It helps you look for and find and, and consume the data that is required for you to do not only your analysis, but also your standard reporting, which is, is coming. So with that, things like you know, baselining, things like having an encapsulated catalog of carbon emission factors. So there's a lot of calculations that go into translating kilowatt hours of specific types of energy into a carbon footprint that looks at metric tons of carbon. And there's a lot a lot of, of those emission factors that are out there, and they are geocentric, they are sometimes government-centric, but they're, 
there's a lot of them. So we have done that and we've encapsulated that within this framework as well, so that once you have identified your business model and how it fits across, in this case, scope one, two, or three, as well as the energy and the location and the way you bring in the data that maps to the model, you now can then put the last piece in there, which is how do I calculate my carbon footprint? And we then on the back end of that allow you to, pr to create and send out your standard reports like GRI type reporting. And there will be, again, lack of standards, but there will be a lot of those coming out. More and more of them will standardize and the, and the population will get smaller over time, but you have to be ready. If you don't have the data and you're not collecting the data and you don't have a feel for your, your use of energy today or your waste or your water, then you're gonna be behind. So again, a simple model, where's the data? A lot of times the data will exist in places like a building management system or a electrical system that you subscribe to. Um, a lot of times it's not automatic. So direct access may not be something you have access to. You may be leasing a building, you may get a bill from your landlord every month. So we have to be flexible in the way to get the data in because again, you need to get started and we don't wanna be in the way of getting started. We wanna help you onboard in this, in this process. So direct access is an option through this, again, technology created and enabled APIs. Again, data and sensors and devices in the IoT space. You have a CO2 sensor in your office, you have a weather station outside, you can connect those things. They're, today's world, all of that is connected to the internet. So you can bring that in. I mentioned bills. You need to be able to manually enter a bill into this system so you can start to track it. Uh, OCR is an option for manually entered bills as well, you know, with an accuracy. And then finally, uh, just, just for fun, bridging the, di the analog digital divide. And, and I heard computer vision talked about just in the last session. You could take a meter that usually gets manually read by someone every month or every so often and point a computer vision enabled camera at it and you can read that with good accuracy. So those are just options. All of those are available. Um, put that into a, again, a system, a model that allows you to create a vision of your assets. Now that could be a, a view of your facilities. You might have one office, you might have 50 plants, you might have a couple of data centers. Those, those types of hierarchical views and how that rolls up east, west, south, however you organize your business. I, I mentioned a mission factor uh, selection and definition. There'll be a catalog of those. You can also create your own uh, custom emission factor and then setting goals so that you can uh, see where you're going. Applying data science uh, and trending to that so that now I can actually interact with the model. Output, output is usage and analyst reports. You get a carbon footprint dashboard. I'll give you some examples of that as well as compliance reporting. So your dashboard, Again, a data, a data twin, I call it. It's a digital twin, but it's a data twin, really. And then being able to send it to other systems. You might have an accounting system that's downstream that, you, that needs to, feed, to get a feed of this type of data, so we can send that through as well. And then finally, compliance. And com compliance is a big deal, and it will continue to be a bigger deal as these types of initiatives hit more mainstream. So as I, as I close up, just a couple of ideas on, I've got, this is an example of a hierarchy that you can create within our system. Um, this is a, uh, th this system sits on top of a, what we call the smart management platform. It's been used uh, in smart cities. It's been used, uh, any of you IndyCar fans, it's been used to watch the race in IndyCar and show the graphics and analytics and predictions that IndyCar does over NBC. It's been used in different other industries as well as manufacturing and transit. Uh, but basically the underlying engine is the same and the use cases, in this case, sustainability and carbon footprint are, are different. So just a little blow up, this is a, a sporting goods company. It's divided into east and west, Maryland, Virginia, California, and then there's facilities there. You can organize it how your business is. Now, this is the, the admissions factor. And when I say there's a lot of these, I'm not kidding. And there's a lot of different ways to look at it. You know, you, you have an emission factor, you can think about it. Is water, is it coal-based, is it 
clean energy, and how do I then convert that into a metric ton of carbon? So there's those screens there. And then after you've done that and you start to collect the data, you get usage statistics. And now I can start to make more informed decisions about my world and my energy footprint. These are some of the examples of a downloadable GRI report that can be generated. So again, it's getting started because you want to be there, you want to be ready when you're going to be asked for these. And these are reports that are already being asked for. Uh, dashboards, interactive dashboards, where you can just kind of roll over things and you know standard things that we look at today. Um, this is actually our Sunnyvale office, NTT Research, where most of this team that's talking to you today resides. Um, and you know, carbon negative is their goal, not even carbon neutrality. So the last few minutes or last few seconds I have, you got to get started. Now's the time. There are tools like this one that can help you along with consulting that can support your needs as a company. And we're using things, again, bringing it back to the research piece, we're using things that were in the labs of like NTT Research 10, 15 years ago, IoT, networking, all of those things that are happening, data science, cloud storage. What I will caution you though is, is that, and this is a little bit tug in cheek, but we don't want to overdo it. So start simple. Stay focused and don't have a dashboard that looks like that. Because the moral of the story is for those that can't read it in the back, there is a dial, the bottom left over there is trending down and they ask him, what is it measuring? It says it measures how well we understand them all. So with that, I wanna thank you very much and have a great afternoon.